Okay, so are uh, there some questions or comments right now? I, I, got, I don't know if this is right because I'm only seeing the thing on point, but then I did extra credit. So. You did an extra credit? Yeah. Um, and uh, I gave you one point for the extra credit. Oh, okay, credit. I didn't see that. Thank okay. You. <laughs> okay. I didn't record it any other special way, so. Okay, I just didn't see that. I didn't okay. Oh, yeah, I think we just didn't want to Okay. Oh, there it is. Um, okay. We have, I, I know, I did, I do have the assignment for 474849, um, excuse me, yeah, 47, that's on the website, um, and I can write that down, too. And I don't know if I have, I didn't, write down the homework, the last homework assignment due for chapter 14 yet, I mean chapter 4. Um, all I know is I have this. So I have 10. This is uh, 4.7, number 6, 8, and 10. 4.8, number 4. And 4.9, number uh, 4. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on 4.8 and 4.9 this, this section, and I'm, I'm going to skip 4.10 for now. Uh, if you're interested in 410 and want to look at it, please go ahead. Um, and then we'll have 11 will be on 411 through 413. We have two more theorems in the last section. That's uh, the open mapping theorem and the closed graph theorem. We need to get those um, theorems. And 48 and 49 are some related topics. 411 is about uh, numerical integration which I thought I might consider. But 410 has to do with things like Cesaro means and, and things like that, um, which might be interesting to some people. That would be interesting to me, actually. Yeah, you might want to look about that. Maybe yeah, you might want to study that section or something. If somebody wants to give a talk, I think George has been clamoring to give a talk for some extra credit or so, um, anybody else in that category, or for substitution credit is welcome. Okay. I'm not sure exactly how to arrange the, the dates for those talks. Any suggestions? We could do it in here. I just, I just got to make sure to get through Chapter 4, and I did want to talk a little bit about self-adjoint operators, if possible, in Chapter 9. But we're really, really rapidly running out of time, so uh, I don't know. How long of a talk should we prepare, like half an hour? Oh, okay. If we wanted to do a half an hour, we could do two half hours in That's one session. Thinking, yeah, does, anybody, so does anybody else want to do that? Do a half hour? Or 40 minutes so far? I'd like okay. to, but I don't know. All right, so we can figure out. I, I mean, I've, I've got a topic that I'd really like to do. I just, I mean, Alex, he picked up that Diffie Fit class, so I picked up his grading, and now I'm even more busy than I'm Okay, to so that's okay. Well, we could. Any, any time then. If it's a half an hour or 45 minute talk, we just take half the hour and have Joyce on, on the line, and then we can just have questions or and some, and do a half a section for the rest of the time. That would be great. So why don't we work it out? Okay. okay. Towards the end, I'm busy too, so give me a little chance to prepare. Maybe towards the end of the. Okay. Like during Dead Week or something? Yeah, that'd be great, actually. Okay, so maybe that Tuesday at Dead Week, if you're yeah. going to do it. Yeah. Okay, because we didn't want to have it on the last day. Right. Perhaps. I just said, in I case there's any questions. Adults, so he's going to help me a little bit with it. Kind of okay. Something, so. Excellent. Okay, then let's just leave that as an open slot. Okay. And uh, maybe we'll just do that, and you all can do evaluations after that, you know. If there's any, there won't be a lot of extra time anyway. Okay. Okay. So uniform bottom is there, and that's what we want next. And it's applications. Uh, there's a kind of interesting application there. So let's do it. Let's take the bare category theorem to, to the next application. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so 4.7.3, uh, Uniform Bottomness Theorem. <coughs> Second key result of this chapter. Uh, let X be a Bonnach space. So we, we're going to need a complete space to be working on. And Y a norm space. And um, assume and then assume T N is a sequence of, of bonded linear operators.
And many times we may just consider a sequence of bounded linear functionals. Okay, those are in particular, in, in, in particular they would be bounded linear operators. Um, so Tn is mapping my space x into y. So my, I have a complete space x, complete metric space, uh, complete uh, norm space. And suppose, this is the, the key hypothesis, suppose that for each x in my space, for every x in my complete norm space, I have that if I take the supremum over all the um, images, Tn of x, okay, then that's a, a finite number depending on x, okay? So, uh, if I fix an x, I can't, uh, uh, go to infinity in y, okay, with this sequence. It'll stay bounded, okay. Then the supremum, then uh, the, the supremum of the norms is indeed finite. In other words, I have a uh, uniformly bounded norm. Okay. Oh, they're all, all the norms are fine, but I'm saying the supremum of the norms is finite now. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so there is a constant C so that uh, T, i.e., there is a constant C. I think this is the way they put it. There's a C greater than zero so that the norm of Tn is less or equal to C for every n. It's the same statement. Okay. All right. How do you go about proving that? And we'll see the application in a minute, but let's just go ahead and see the proof first. What we're going to do is we're going to apply the Baer category theorem. What we want to do is, if I'm going to apply the Baer category theorem, I want to, um, let's see, I want, since X is a complete metric space in particular, I want to be able to write X as a union of uh, sets and uh, I somehow want to use the fact that if, if I have X as a countable union, then none of those, excuse me, at least one of those uh, <coughs> sets is not rare, okay? So it'll contain some open ball. And so that's the whole point is that X is itself non meager by bare category theorem I guess it's four point seven dash one or seven dash two um, X is non meager okay this is, is this sounds foreign at this point in itself, that is, if X equals a union of sets MK, countable union, uh, then uh, not all uh, MK are rare. That is, uh, MK not bar contains an open set, an open ball for some, uh, open ball B, zero, R, okay? For some K naught. Okay, that's what I'm going to use. All right. They're not all rare. Okay, so at least one of them has to have some substance to it. Okay, has to have open ball. Okay. Somehow, you, the, if X was complete, you can't have 
Exodus the union and accountable union of thin sets. Okay? That's the idea. There has to be some fatness to at least one of them. Okay? In the complete case. Right? So we couldn't uh, we couldn't write uh, R three is a countable union of planes. Okay? The whole thing. You, you wouldn't fill all the points in R three in that way. Okay. Or surfaces somehow. You couldn't dream up some wild surfaces uh, that were all themselves rare. Okay. And have the whole R three is a kind of a union of those surfaces. Okay. So so one of them has to have some uh, thickness. Okay. And that's the idea. So what am I going to do? How am I going to define those A? What I'm going to do is define some A case. And what I'm going to define is a k as follows. Let's see, let's the magic idea. How am I going to get all of x? Define a k equal to the set of all x in my phonics space such that t n x is less than or equal to k um, for all n equals 1, 2, 3. So I can put the for all n in there. There's two parameters, an n and a k. But I'm putting the one of the parameters and saying for every n, tn of x should be less than or equal to k in norm. So that's the um, saying this is the um, the x's so that the um, The sequence of images, Tn of x, all lie in a ball with center of the zero in y and radius k in y. All right? So we know that all the x's actually have, uh, all those sequences do lie in such a ball, all right, for every x. In other words, the union of all these, there is some ball that does contain this sequence, okay, for every x, because that was my assumption. My assumption was that if I take this sequence, Tn of x, okay, that's a bunch of images in y, right? So I've got y sitting here, and I've got Tn of x. That's a sequence. It doesn't go to infinity, right? So it's in some ball, okay? Okay. And I'm saying, look at all the x's that stay inside a ball of radius k. All right? Consider all the x's, then, that do that job. Okay? Well, uh, there's always some of them. In fact, uh, every x must eventually be covered if I take all possible k. All right? So that means the union of a k is equal to x. All right? But given, given any x, indeed, given any x, this is k, uh, if k, as long as k is greater than equal to c sub x, as long as k is greater than equal to c sub x, then this sequence stays inside the ball of radius k. This is b0 k in y. Okay? <clears throat> and this is the sequence Tn of x, n equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. So that's the whole sequence, just a little flight of b's inside. That's going to stay inside some kind of finite field, <laughs> okay? The b's aren't going to go too far. They're not going to go to infinity to get their clover, right? So, uh, so they're going to stay in there, all right? So... Let's see. Uh, indeed, in given x, okay, there exists uh, a k greater than or equal to c sub x. So x is given x in x. There exists a k greater than or equal to c. So x is in a sub k. All right. That means that that every x is in the infinite union of the a sub k's. So in particular x belongs to the union a sub k. k goes from 1 to infinity. Therefore, I have inclusion. Therefore, capital X is a subset of the union a sub k. k goes from 1 to infinity. Okay.
which is all I have to show them to show equality. So I have, I do have a countable union of sets. Now the question is, uh, uh, what happens if I close the sets? Okay, well the claim is each of these is already closed. All right, how do you see that? That's immediate from the continuity of the norm and the, um, and the continuity of, of T. Let's see, how does that work? We don't have a good eraser today. I guess this will have to do. How do I show that that AK is already closed? That's probably should follow by what we've done already, but let's just see it. First, I claim that if I just consider for one N, then that's a closed set. All right? So if I take A sub K N equals the set of all X such that T N of X simply is less or equal to K in norm, Okay, I claim that that is a closed set. This is closed uh, as follows. Uh, suppose I just need to show that um, it contains all summit points, right? Let uh, I got to use uh, x super j go to x. Okay. Um, <clears throat> x super j in this a k n, right? <clears throat> x in capital X. Okay, I'm going to show that X is itself at a k n. All right? Then what I have is that I have t n x super j in norm is less than or equal to k. Now let um, that uh, this whole business by, uh, goes because Tn is a bounded linear operator. We don't know what its norm is, but it's finite. Okay. Then we know that this converges to Tn of x, right, in, uh, in y, converges in y. So that is the norm in y, Tn uh, x super j minus t n x uh, in norm is less than the norm of t n, which is some finite number, times x j minus x, okay, that goes to zero as j goes to infinity. Okay. Therefore, uh, therefore, uh, T N X super J. Okay. Um, actually uh, converges to T N of X. Okay, that's by continuity of the norm. We've been through that's a reverse triangle inequality or triangle inequality, depending on how where you start from. Okay? So we've done that from the beginning of chapter two. Okay? So this norm converges by continuity of the norm. Okay, so I'm verifying this, so this is verified, okay, that this convergence as a sequence is verified, okay? Okay, so therefore, by kind of the norm, I get this, okay, these are all less than or equal to k, therefore, the limit, tn of x is less than or equal to k. The norm of less than or equal to k implies then the norm of tn of x is less than or equal to k. All right. So what you have is that a n k is closed. So x any possible limit point is in a k n. Therefore, a k n is closed. But a k itself is the intersection of all these a k n's n goes from 1 to infinity because the statement was that tn of x should be less than or equal to k for each n equals 1, 2, 3. And therefore, I have an intersection, uh, uh, intersection of closed sets is closed. The complement is the union of open sets, which is open. So this is intersection of closed sets. So closed. Okay, so ak bar is equal to ak. Have, um, 
basically, uh, what you have is that uh, is that what you really have is this is a the norm of t of the norm of a bonilinear operator applied to x. Okay, is a continuous function from x to the uh, non-negative reals. So really, all I'm using here. So in summary, in summary, all I'm using is that if I have a continuous function, uh, I have a, that uh, if I have a continuous function um, from a metric space to the non-negative uh, reals, okay, I'm not even using completeness here, okay. If I have a, if f is from a metric space to the reals. Okay, is continuous function the, uh, summary so, uh, of closure of, of close closure of clo of a k n close summary of this argument. If I have a function from metric, this is a continuous function. Then, then the set A equals the set where f uh, is less than or equal to. Um, K, that is closed. Okay, that's going to be closed. All right. Again, uh, I just showed the disclosure. I let x k um, go to x. All right. Um, if f of x k is less uh, uh, x j, because if I let x j, because if x j if xj goes to x um, in in capital X, all right, where xj belongs to A, all right, I want to show that x belongs to A, right? So to show uh, to show x belongs to A. So I'm just going over this analysis, this argument we just went through, just, just to make sure that you're not feeling stymied by it. Okay. Uh, well, then you just, you just do the same thing we did here. We, um, we have f is continuous. Okay. F is continuous, so uh, f of xj is less than equal to k on the one hand, but also f of x super j goes to f of x by continuity. So uh, when I take, this is just the limit of real numbers, okay, in R. So if I've got a, a, a sequence of real numbers all less than or equal to k, then the limit is also less than or equal to k. That's a simple lemma from real variables, okay? If the limit, if the limit was bigger than k, you'd get a contradiction with an epsilon argument, right? So. Uh, limit f of x super j equals f of x is less than equal to k. So k x is in a. A was the set of all x such that f of x is less than equal to k. I didn't put all the x's in there. Okay. So that's exactly what I'm doing. All I'm using the fact is that this norm of t x is a continuous function, which we'd already noted way back in chapter two. Okay, so that's really all that's being used. Okay, um, inverse image of a closed set. This is this this semi-infinite interval minus infinity to k is a closed set in the real line. Inverse image of a closed set is closed. If you have a continuous mapping from one metric space to another, inverse image of a closed set is closed. Inverse image of an open set is open. Okay, that's some stuff for metric spaces in continuity. That's in chapter one. Okay, so this is all old, older review stuff. Anyway, so AK is closed. So therefore, what I've got is that, um, therefore, um, uh, what did I say? Not all, not all of these AKs can be rare by completeness of X. So that means AK naught bar contains an open ball, okay? But AK bar is just AK, so no. So, AK bar equals AK, so therefore, by, by 472, AK 
AK naught contains B zero R for some R greater than zero, some some open ball in X. Ah, uh, no, 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 I shouldn't say zero. It contains some open ball X naught R. Okay, for some X naught. Okay. Uh, I didn't say zero. I meant X naught. Okay. Okay. So. All right, so now what I'm going to do is now let z equals x naught plus r over 2 times x, where x is uh, a unit vector. I think some of you used this type of argument in, uh, in one of your problems for this homework. Anyway, we've used it before. Let's go to some other point in the ball. All right, take any arbitrary direction, x. Okay in my norm space and just go in that direction but don't go very far. Go R over two units. Okay? But it's a positive distance that I can go, all right, because that keeps Z in the ball. Now what do I know? I know that what is the definition of A K naught? A K naught contains all of the ball. Alright? So for every ball every point X or every point Z in the ball in particular, Tn of z is less than equal to k naught for all n. All right, so Tn of z is less than equal to k naught for all n. Okay, equals one, two, three, and also Tn of x naught, the center of the ball, is less than equal to k naught for all n equals one, two, three. All right. So that's kind of a nice statement, right? Because both z, z and x naught belonging to the ball x naught r, which is a set, which is a subset of a k naught, that implies that all of these are true, right? And that's for all x of norm one. So what do I get out of that? Well, let's go ahead and compute t n of x then, all right? T n of x. Tn of x is equal to Tn of z minus x naught over r over 2. I can take the r over 2 by linearity of Tn. And so now, um, now I can put norms. I'm going to put norms here eventually. Okay. And which is uh, 2 over r times the norm of Tn of z minus the uh, Tn of x naught. And I'll just take, I already have bound for the norm of those, each of those, so I'll just use a triangle inequality. Less than or equal to 2 over r, Tn of z is at most k naught. Tn of x naught, so even though there's a minus sign, I'm just going to throw the minus sign away and use the plus sign by the triangle inequality. And I'm just simply going to get 2k naught from each of those. So this is equal to 2 times 2k naught, or less than or equal to, over r, which is a finite number. And that's independent of n. And this is true for all n equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay, so there's the proof. Because now I have tn of x is, is, uh, is, is uniformly bounded in n, and x was a uh, vector, arbitrary vector of norm 1. Therefore, soup n greater than equal to 1, t, uh, let's see, just first I'll say tn of x over norm x, norm x equals to 1, okay, uh, is therefore less than or equal to uh, 4k naught over r for all n equals 1, 2, and 3, and so on. Um, I'm doing dividing by one here. <laughs> okay, this is just one. Okay, so I don't need to divide it. All right, and therefore, soup. So therefore, the norm. This is the norm of T n. So we've got a bound for the norm of T n. It's a finite number, independent of n. Therefore, the supremum of the norms is finite. Okay, so this uniform body is there. Now, how could that be of any use? You wonder. Okay, 
So what we want to do is show that at least it'll give us some kind of existence there. Um, so let's just see at least one application of that in uh, Fourier series. Okay, so there's... Well, actually, there was one other example. Um, we could do that again. Let's, do, let's redo the example we did at the end of the hour last time. So let's have a couple examples. Um, let's redo the example we had at the end of the hour last time where we considered all polynomials um, with a certain uh, norm on the polynomials, so the space of polynomials. Let's try that again. Uh, let's see how it works. Uh, so, 474 is the application. Um, you have x equals um, a space of polynomials, all polynomials. x of t equals alpha 0 plus alpha 1 t plus and so on plus alpha n t to the n. Uh, of course, complex coefficients or something, alpha 1, alpha 2, alphas in, in the complex numbers and n greater than or equal to 0. Okay, integer. Um, I'm not going to go, last time I talked about, uh, if I talked about the polynomials of degree at most n, I started to talk about them being meager and so on and so forth. I'm not going to even bother with that now. I'm just going to go straight to the uniform boundaries theorem and see if I can apply it. What I want to show is that x is not complete, because if it was, then I'd have some kind of, then I'd have the conclusion of the uniform boundaries theorem for a certain linear functional. So let's introduce a linear functional. Introduce f sub n of x equals alpha 0 plus alpha 1 plus and so on plus alpha sub n minus 1 where if, some, if uh, x has degree less than n then these last alphas are just 0. So in other words just think of uh, x having infinitely many coefficients most of which are 0. Okay, so you can always, you can always define uh, x with infinitely many coefficients as long as they eventually are zero thereafter. So you, you might as well assume that alphas for all n are defined. Okay, so it's kind of thinking, uh, and what did we have? We had the norm of x uh, was equal to uh, the maximum of all the alpha uh, j's. Uh, do I use j? Yeah, let's just say I'll use j. Overall, j greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So that's like I guess what we're we're looking at is something that looks a lot like um, what was it? Um, all the uh, sequences. What did we had l infinity, right? And then we took a subspace of l infinity by taking all sequences which are eventually zero. Um, that is uh, a subspace, okay, and we want to show that that's not complete. <laughs> right, right, roughly, that's what we're doing here, okay, because all the uh, t to the n is doing is sort of holding a place here. So now, if I take this, just take the uh, sum of the first n coefficients, alpha 0 through alpha n minus 1, that's a linear function, linear functional. Um, what is the norm of Fn? What I have is that I have the norm of Fn um, well, it's certainly, well what is Fn of x? Let's just take the absolute value of Fn of x. I have to compute the norm of Fn of x in order to do this problem. The norm of Fn, of, the absolute value of Fn of x is less than or equal to alpha 0 plus alpha 1 plus and so on plus alpha sub n minus 1 absolute value. Um, now, well, how many? Now, take the maximum of them, and then multiply it by n, and that would be a bound. 
this is less than or equal to n times the norm of x, okay, times the maximum of the coefficients. Okay, so the norm of fn is therefore always less than or equal to n, but a claim is that it actually equal to n. Because I can take a polynomial that's long enough so that it has all n coefficients, okay. So therefore f sub n is less than or equal to n, but uh, f sub n of 1 plus t plus t squared plus and so on plus t to the n is equal to n. Okay, so I can take a long enough polynomial, and therefore, uh, and, and this polynomial has norm 1. This, if I consider this, this x has norm 1, because the maximum of the coefficients is 1. Okay, so therefore, uh, maybe I only need a t to the n minus 1 here. Okay, <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so therefore, fn of a uh, vector of norm 1 is equal to n, therefore the norm of, of fn Therefore, the norm uh, is achieved. F norm of Fn is equal to n. Maximum possible norm is achieved. So, okay. So, is that any good? Well, that means that the norms of these linear functionals are not uniformly bounded. Okay. Well, but does the hypothesis of the uniform boundedness claim apply? The claim is that it does. Claim the hypothesis. Claim um, the condition sup n greater than or equal to 1 of fn of a fixed x, okay, uh, in absolute value is finite, okay, holds for every x in the, uh, the space. Let's just check that. What is the, if I fix an x now, then it has finite degree. X has degree uh, n sub x or something like that. Okay, so that means that if I think f sub n of x, that's going to be an absolute value less than or equal to. Let's see, however many. Um, it was just this this thing. Um, it's going to be a lot like this. Um, what is it going to be? F sub n. I'm going to go, uh, well, the most it can be ever be is, let's see, because uh, I'll get, this is going to be, if n is, is, if n is greater than or, re or equal to n sub x plus 1, okay, then I'm just going to get a bunch of zeros, right? So then f sub n of x is going to be alpha 0 plus alpha 1 plus and so on plus alpha sub n minus 1 plus, excuse me, plus alpha sub n sub x um, plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, where there's now n minus 1 terms, okay? And if n is less than or equal to n sub x, you just stop it earlier. Okay, so what an absolute value then is going to be this, which is less than or equal, therefore, to f, f, alpha 0 plus alpha 1 plus and so on plus alpha sub n sub x. Now there's n sub x plus 1 terms, which is less than or equal to n sub x plus 1 times the norm of x. The norm of x is just some constant. This n sub x plus 1 is some constant, so this is independent of n, the little n, okay? So then this is, this is verified, okay? This is independent of little n. So in other words, this, this f sub n of x is less than or equal to this number for all n. Okay? Well, it's independent of little n. Okay. There's a most, if x has is, is got a, a polynomial degree, a 1,000, then the, this linear function evaluates to a most uh, 1,001 times whatever the maximum coefficient of x was. Okay? That's it, no matter how large n is. So that is, this condition does is satisfied, yet the, the norms are not bounded, therefore x is incomplete. Because if x was incomplete, we'd have the uniform boundedness there. Okay. Okay. All right, so that's kind of a roundabout way to, to, to apply the theorem. But anyway, you get the... Incomplete with...
with that norm. Okay? It's not a bonding space. Now you get the flavor of a kind of. Okay. Playing around with estimations and all this norm kind of stuff we've been doing, playing around with the structure and seeing what you can get, playing with this soup. Okay. So. What's another application? Another application may seem a little bit more substantial. Let's go back to Fourier series. Okay. Um, let's recall what we were doing with Fourier series. Uh, another example, 4.7-5. Okay. What we want to show is that the Fourier series of a 2 pi periodic real value continuous function need not converge at every point. Okay. Um, I think you've, you've seen some examples where you take, um, or if, if the, if you take, uh, I think everybody's sort of seen this example where they take a function that jumps. Let's say this is pi and this is minus pi, and I take this uh, odd function. Um, it goes like this and then, and then jumps down again and so on. It goes like this. And so it's periodic like that, okay? kind of a square wave, all right, looking thing. Uh, what you, what do you, the Fourier series uh, converges at every point except, well, it actually converges at every point, okay, on this graph, all right, because it turns out that uh, this function is a bounded variation, okay, <laughs> that's the key, the key point, okay. And it goes through this point. And so on. Okay? So this is a this is a finite Fourier series approximation of this function. Okay? But okay, it does converge at every point. Uh, if I put this transition point somewhere else up the line, it wouldn't converge there. So it has it converges at the so called mean value, right? But is it true that for every, if I had a continuous function, arbitrary continuous function, 2 pi periodic continuous function, so in other words, you have to have f of minus pi equals f of pi, okay, and otherwise continuous. If f, or if, uh, you know, if x, I'm going to call it, if x is 2 pi periodic continuous function, um, um, is it so, is it true that the Fourier series converges at each t in, well, minus pi to pi? If it converges at pi, it converges at minus pi too because it's the same value, but you know, at each point in the circle, okay? Is it true? Well, for a particular uh, continuous function, it may be true. We have some other example. You know, if you do a sawtooth wave or whatever, we know that that works somehow. Uh, or maybe, maybe we didn't prove it in this class, but you've seen sort of evidence that it works. But is it true for any continuous function? In other words, are there counterexamples where you have a continuous function which doesn't converge at every point somehow? Maybe the finite uh, Fourier series aren't even bounded. Okay. And that's what we're going to show. We're going to be able to show with the uniform bottom system, we're going to show an existence proof. Okay. We're going to show an existence proof. 
So consider X is going to be the space C01, excuse me, 0 or minus pi to 2 pi. I guess I started with minus pi to pi, so I'll stick with that. Okay, it could be in the closed interval like <laughs> 2 pi. Okay, um, so we're going to take that uh, per periodic. We're going to take the periodic functions. Okay, so x of minus pi equals x of pi. That's still going to be a nice complete space, obviously. Okay, so. And we're going to take, uh, this is going to be uh, our space. And then we're going to take, what we're going to take is a, um, we're going to take um, the Fourier coefficients. What we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, we're going to say x of t is going to be 1 half a0 plus summation j goes from 1 to n, aj, uh, excuse me, j goes to infinity, aj cosine. Um, jt plus summation, well, I'll just put the bj here, bj sine jt. So whether the Fourier series converges or not, I can always construct it. We have a certain formulas for the Fourier coefficients and so on. Do I need to recall what those are? Um, I might have to recall what the Fourier coefficients are. Usually we just write this down. We write the, the tilde. So in other words, this is the formal expansion that I would write, where I construct certain. This is the formal infinite Fourier series, all right, and I construct the aj um, as. Um, let's see, what is the formula for aj? I might have to look that up. No, oh, here it is. Um, it's one over two pi integral 0 to 2 pi or minus pi to pi. Uh, maybe I should go 0 to 2 pi. It looks like I'm going to work on 0 to 2 pi. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just screw myself up here. Okay, 0 to 2 pi. 0 to 2 pi. Um, x of t cosine jt. Uh, dt. Okay, there's the cosine one and there's the bj one also, but I'm going to be mostly working with the cosine one and I have bj equal to uh, 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi x of t sine jt, dt j equals 1, 2, and so on. So there's a formal Fourier series, and a0 is with j equal to 0. Uh, this is bj is for j equals 1, and this is for uh, aj is also with j equal to 0, 1, 2 for this one, okay? I can... Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm figuring out whether it's a 1 over 2 pi or a 1 over pi. I think it's just a 1 over 2, 1 over pi. I don't know why we've got the 1 over 2 pi there. I'll maybe fix this up. Is this the right formula? I think maybe it's 1 over pi, not 1 over 2 pi. Let's look back in. Is it? Yeah, 1 over pi. The reason is, you can always remember, is that since I have the 1 half a0 here, this is supposed to be the mean value. This is the mean value. So with the mean value, the cosine is 1. And I'm supposed to get 1 over 2 pi integral x of t. All right, so <laughs> that's how you remember it. Okay. Yeah, another way to think about it is if I had a pure cosine, if x was a pure cosine, then the integral would be pi, okay? Because the pure cosine would match this cosine, the integral from 0 to 2 pi would only be one half the length of the interval. Because cosine squared is only, uh, cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. So cosine squared basically only evaluates to a half, okay? So, anyway, so they only have to divide by pi to get the right mean. Okay. What, do I, what am I going to introduce in order to apply this uniform boundariness theorem? Apply uniform boundariness theorem. Uh, as follows. 
put, introduce f sub n to equal one half f sub n of x. Okay, so now linear functional, similar as before. I'm going to take the um, I'm just going to take the uh, cosine coefficients. One half a zero plus a one plus a two plus and so on plus a sub n. Okay, that's going to be a linear functional. Okay, obviously if I have a sum of two x's and the, the co you know, if I take x1 plus x2, I'll get an aj1 and an aj2, they'll add. Okay, so that's a linear functional. Is it bounded? Uh, well, let's see. Um, yes, we'll, we'll show a bound for it. Okay, but we're going to do that. We're going to show that it, there is bounded, but let's see if we can find a bound for it. Okay, and then actually what we're going to do is we're going to try to evaluate the norm of Fn, same as we did over there. We got, F, we got the norm of Fn going to infinity. I'm going to show that the norm of this goes to infinity too. Okay. So if I can show the norm of Fn goes to infinity, since I do have a complete metric space in this case, we will show, we aim to show, so I'll show you the what I'm trying to get after, that the norm of Fn uh, goes to infinity, okay, like it did over there. All right, but this time we have a complete metric space. So therefore, by 4.7-3, if I did have this, this condition, I have a contradiction. Therefore, I must not have this condition for every x. Therefore, by 4.7-3, there must exist an x such that um, f sub n of x, um, the sup overall n, is infinite. In other words, the partial series here does not remain bounded, okay, i.e., if I take the Fourier series, the uh, Fourier series at of x at t equal to zero will just give me this series right here gives f sub n of x equals to um, one half a zero plus a one plus and so on plus a n at the nth uh, sum, okay, or at the, after the nth, uh, as a partial sum, and this partial sum does not remain bounded. So in particular, it doesn't converge. You might think uh, you, you might think okay, so it goes it, it goes to some point, you know. Uh, well, here it's it's not this picture. Okay, it's a different picture of a different function, obviously, because this one was a convergent. But somehow you're you're not the Fourier series doesn't the finite Fourier series doesn't is may sometimes come back to this point, but it's always going far away. Again, okay, the partial sums don't remain bounded. Okay, so maybe some subsequence converges. Okay? Some subsequences of partial sums. Okay? But the partial sums themselves don't. Okay? Perhaps some subsequence. That's not proved. So this is what we need to show. So what we need to show is that therefore the norm of this functional is unbounded. How do I actually get the norm of that functional? We bring in the Dirichlet kernel, <clears throat> which I'm going to have to spend a couple minutes introducing. Okay? So, what is a Dirichlet kernel? I want to basically just bring in the sum of the cosines, right? Because that's how I'm actually going to do it. What I'm going to have is that um, 
I have fn of x, which is, uh, I'm just, so I'm just talking, this is just the, if I take t equal to zero, everybody sees that this is just the, uh, finite, the uh, partial sum of the Fourier series at t equal to zero, right? Now I'm going to write it another way. Yet another way. Okay. I'm going to write fn of x, okay, is equal to, um, one half a zero plus a one plus and so on plus a n equal to one over two pi just take the definition of the aj's right um, integral zero to two pi um, x of t times one plus let's see what do I have here Two cosine. I think I've left a factor out. Two cosine summation. Uh, J goes from one to n. Two cosine J T. D T. This two cancels that two. All right, to give me the right number. Okay. So here's the thing in the square bracket. And I'm going to call that. Um, Dirichlet's kernel, D uh, N of T. There's, there are other kernels in this in this subject. But anyway, this is the one that I'm going to look at. Okay. So what is that thing? We have an identity for that thing. Okay. You can actually write down what this trigonometric sum is. Have, ever, have everybody seen that before? Some people, you have seen it because you had to study four years. <laughs> okay. So what, how do you do it, Joyce? Don't remember? <laughs> okay. The identity is this. Identity is that this function, in other words, I'm, I'm getting this functional just by integration against something, right? Against what? I guess this function here, identity, is that this 1 plus um, summation m goes from 1, I'm going to use m now, m goes from 1 to n, 2 cosine mt, okay, is equal to, um, so this is the dnt, equals this, 1 plus this, is equal to sine of n plus a half times t, divided by sine of a half t. So you can actually uh, make this sum in closed form. Okay. Which makes sense at t equal to zero by L'Hopital's rule. At t equal to zero, you'll get uh, 2n plus 1 in the limit, right? Because sine of t, sine of theta is about theta, so this is um, n plus a half t divided by a half t, uh, t goes out and you get 2n plus 1, which makes sense. If I put t equal to 0 here, I get 2n plus 1. So at least the formula fits at t equal to 0. Okay, now the claim is that the formula fits everywhere. <laughs> okay, I mean, there's lots of formulas that would fit at t equal to 0. How do you show that it's true everywhere? What's the basic, how do you do this? Well, they do with uh, trig identities in the book. The easier way, though, I think, is if you needed to f uh, figure this out on the fly, you would do uh, complex exponentials. So the way you do it is you say 1 um, plus twice, again, I left this factor out, the 2 factor out, m equals 1 to n cosine mt is equal to the real part of the sum. K goes, excuse me, uh, m goes from minus n to n of e to the i mt. Okay? Because the real part of the exponential is the cosine. Uh, I'm going negative ends and positive ends to pick up the two. Okay? And I'm using the fact that cosine of, of mt is equal to cosine minus mt. Okay? The cosine is even. So then you have just a, a geometric sum here, it turns out. Okay? So I, I evaluate this, then take the real part. Okay? How do I evaluate the exponential sum? That's a finite geometric series, which you've all seen a million times. Okay, so you can actually compute this thing out. The finite geometric series is 
summation e to the minus imt, m equals from minus n to n, is equal to, I first pull out e to the minus int, so I get all positive terms, then I get uh, 1 plus e to the it plus e to the 2it, plus and so on. How many times will I get it up? I'll get it up to e to the um, uh, two, uh, 2 nit, right? 2 nit. Here, positive, because there you have plus, and over here have minus. Switch. Or? Here, over there, you have e to the int, the real part of. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, like all the way over here, you have e to the int, and then you put e to the minus int. So yeah, what I'm doing is I'm pulling it e to the minus int out. The lowest term is e to the minus int. Right. The lowest term is e to the minus int, then it's e to the minus. I, n minus 1t, then e and so on, so it's e to the minus 10it, e to the minus 9it, e to the minus 8it, e to the minus 7it, up to 1, plus e to the it, plus e to the 2it. So I'm putting out the e to the minus 10it out, so they get all plus angles on the remaining sum. So then there's um, 2n plus 1 sum adds, okay? The 2n positive angles and the 1 0 angle, okay? So I'm pulling the e to the minus int out is all I'm doing. So I get a geometric series that starts with 1. I always love my geometric series to start with 1. I don't have to, okay, but I like it. The common ratio is e to the it, right? So I get that this is e to the minus int times, let's see, 1 minus, I go to the next highest power, which is 2n plus 1 it, and then divide by 1 minus e to the it. This is just the way I do geometric sums. I always pull the first term out so I know what I'm working with, okay, and double checks that I have the right geometric series. Okay, then I just put it back together again, okay? And so what I do now is I can, I want to get some, uh, I can pull it half, I can pull a, um, I introduce an e to the minus one half it in the top and the bottom so I'll get the sign coming in. So multiply by e to the minus I'm running out of time, so I'm going to do this. Just throw this extra factor in, okay? E to the minus it over 2 over e to the minus it over 2. And then put everything back together again. And I get e to the minus i times n plus a half t minus e to the i n plus a half t, if you work it out. Okay, you got the minus n going with the 2n plus 1, that's an n plus 1, but now take another half away, n plus a half. That's on the positive angle. On the negative angle, I have two negative angles that add the e to the minus n plus a half. Okay, divide by e to the minus it over 2 minus e to the it over 2. Okay, and that's what you're using is that sine of theta is e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta all over 2i. The 2i's will cancel. And therefore, and you'll get uh, a negative sign over a negative sign. That'll also cancel. Okay. So then you just get the sine of n plus a half t over sine of a half t. Okay. Why not throwing in the two i's and all that? So there's a Dirichlet kernel. Now I'm running out of time. I won't be able to finish it. <clears throat> I've already told you what I want to show. Now I just have to show you that I can get it, and the rest is going to be a bunch of integration. Uh, what I have is that this gets a little tricky because you have to believe me. What I know now is that the norm inequality I have fn of x is the 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi x of t dn of t. Now what does dn of t look like? dn of t just looks like, well, you can graph it. You can figure out what it's got to be is periodic. And at uh, 2 pi, you can figure out what it looks like, too, I guess, or pi. I'm going to graph it on minus pi to pi. Um, so it's got, it basically looks like this. I don't know. I'm not doing a very good job. I'm sure there's a deeper well there, okay? And then a smaller wells and so on, okay? Like this. This is my dn. If you actually integrate it from minus pi to pi, you get uh, 2 pi. You just get basically 1, all right, except, divide, you, the, except for the normalization 2 pi, all right? So there's a lot of cancellation, okay? It integrates to uh, 2 pi, so that 1 over 2 pi times integral dn of t is 1. 
Yeah, the integral integral you know integral zero to two pi of one plus two summation cosine j t e t will be equal. All the cosines will go out, so you just get two pi. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, this it almost integrates to zero, but it has one left. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, it's big at t equal to zero. We said it was 2n plus 1, so it's going to infinity. Some kind of a, it's called an approximation of the identity. Okay? It's a lot, it's, it serves the same purpose as a delta function. Okay? In this context. Now, Uh, what is the deal then? Therefore, fn of x, let's just get at least the one norm inequality. fn of x is less or equal to, therefore, 1 over 2 pi. I can pull out the, the max norm. We are working with the sup norm, or the max norm. Okay, so can, x is a continuous function. So what is it, what's the basic inequality for this? Okay, I take absolute values inside. Okay, then I take the max norm on xt and pull it out. Okay, and so then I get the integral. So I get this number. Okay, so this is the, this is a bound for the norm of fn. So fn in norm is less than or equal to 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi dn of t dt. Okay. But the claim is actually you can achieve that norm. What would I do in order to get that? What I'd want to do is, you see, I've got my x. Of, I can achieve this norm almost. Okay. This is actually the best. You should remember from when we did these estimations way back in Chapter 2, we had to do this, that I can actually achieve this norm. Remember I did that with this function? I had plus 1 on the left and minus 1 on the right, and we were working in the same context. How did I actually achieve? What I did is I took a function that looked like this. That was my continuous function. Okay, so what I had is I had integral uh, minus pi to zero x of t. My functional was this f of x equals this from old homework problem, old homework. I had the continuous functions x, and I had this uh, integral zero to pi. Maybe it wasn't minus pi to zero and zero to pi, but it was minus one to zero x of t dt. This was the linear functional. This is a linear functional. And I said, well, okay, well, the absolute, um, this f of x in absolute value is less than or equal to uh, integral zero, minus pi to zero um, absolute value of x of t dt. All I could do was a plus sign here, okay? Plus integral zero to pi absolute value of x of t dt, okay? Which is... And then, I'd, and then I use the max norm, which is less than or equal, therefore, to 2 pi times the norm of x, to the max norm of x. Okay? How do I actually achieve that norm? Asymptotically, in other words, I didn't achieve it exactly, but I took, what I had to do was take a continuous function so that um, the integral uh, basically um, was constant. In other words, this, this, was, this was a, what I'm going to do is take a function which is 1 and then minus 1, okay, then what happens? If I take a function which is 1, I get pi, and a function which is minus 1, I get another pi, right? So I get 2 pi. The norm of 1, of a function which is 1 or minus 1 is 1, okay? The max norm is 1. So I achieve the 2 pi equals 2 pi. But except for the fact that I, that's not a continuous function, so I have to transfer here, okay? But that's only going to change the integral a little itty bit, okay? Because it's a very short interval. So therefore, I can get greater than or equal to, I can get f of x greater than, I can find there exists x of epsilon, norm x epsilon equal to 1, that's a continuous function with f of x epsilon greater than or equal to 2 pi minus epsilon, okay? in this example. All right, so I do the same thing here. And I get that, in fact, the norm, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, my 
x epsilon to be 1 when dn is positive and minus 1 when dn is negative. And I'm just going to transfer like this then. Uh, 1 is 1 and minus 1 and 1 and minus 1 and so on. So I'm going to take x epsilon equals 1 when dn is greater than 0 and negative 1 when dn is negative. And that's going to be, so I'm going to stick in a 1 or plus or minus 1 here against dn. Here I have to stick that in here, right here. Okay? And I'm going to stick that in, and that's going to give me the absolute value of dn, except for these little changeover points. And there's a bunch of them, but I can make it as small as I like. I'm fixing n here. I can make those changeovers as small as I want for fixed n and get rid of it. Okay? So therefore, the norm of fn is equal to 1 over 2 pi minus pi to pi or zero to two pi. Same thing. Okay. This. And now there's the estimation in the book and which is standard. And so I'll just we can go over it again next time. But then you just calculate this and show that it goes is goes to infinity like the uh, diverges like the harmonic series, basically like log n. Okay? So then this you calculate using uh the, the explicit formula is sine of n plus a half t over sine of a half t. Okay? And I'll have to leave that till, you know, next time. I'll just clean it up next time. Calculate using this. All right? So you just plug that in there with absolute value signs. Okay? Using this absolute value sign. So you show that if I put, if I, the total uh, area between the curve and the x-axis, or the t-axis here, it really is, as n gets large, as the total area is getting, getting infinite. Okay? Yeah. Um, basically, what you're going to have is... Uh, okay. Uh, Oh, okay. Well, we'll analyze it next time since we're out of time. Okay? So you actually compute this dang thing. You actually compute this thing and show it goes to infinity. Show norm fn goes to infinity. So, in the bottom line is that for the conclusion of the uniform botanist theorem, again, I used a linear functional instead of a linear operator. That was a special case. The norms aren't uniformly bounded. Okay? So therefore, the only thing that could have gone wrong was this hypothesis in the uniform botanist theorem, since I had a complete metric space, or a complete uh, norm space. <coughs> okay. Very good. So I think that's kind of a classy thing. Apparently, there, there is, I guess, I think probably Fayer or somebody like that made up a, a Connor example. They finally found one. But this is a nice existence there, and shown there has to be a Connor example. Okay, whether you could find it or not is not clear. And somebody, I believe they said in the, in the remarks that there was somebody who found one. Okay. So, <laughs> explicit one. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Didn't you say this next?